Do you know, I heard Farage this morning saying that the, the country's broken. I saw, I saw that. How many more of the people responsible for the state of the nation are going to campaign on the idea that they are innocent victims? They're just normal men. They're just innocent men. Um, and, and they are the ones that we can entrust the, the rebuilding of, of, the, of the nation to. I have to tell you something really annoying. All right. I don't know if you were listening yesterday. You know the score. If you weren't, I need a letter from your mum by break this morning. Um, but I do suffer from something called <laughs> per de, per, 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 political per de paranoia. And political per de paranoia, which was invented by Peter Piper, who used to pick T-shirt. No, no. Uh, political per de paranoia involves me, after 20 years in this job, not really knowing what I am and am not allowed to say when we are in an election period. I, I have tried on many, many occasions to uh, uh, get my head around it. And I err on the side of caution. I have fallen foul of these rules once. Would you believe involving a by-election at a, constitu a certain constituency in Essex? I told you it was Groundhog Day. <laughs> and, so, and, and, and unlike some broadcast companies that have appeared on your, uh, on, on your television schedules relatively recently, we, we at LBC care about Ofcom regulation and, and recognise the absolute importance of having rules in place for broadcast media that prevent people from spreading lies and conspiracy theories. But some of the rules are a little recondite. They are a little... Uh, a, a little hard to grasp. Newspapers can do whatever the hell they want in the run-up to an election, or indeed on the day of elections and by-elections, but, but broadcast journalists categorically cannot. How many alliterations can we get in before quarter past ten this morning? They categorically cannot. And um, uh, as David points out, political per de paranoia is a pain in the proverbial. Uh, a fellow fan there of uh, tortured alliteration. So, where do you begin on a day like today? I, I, I mean, it, it's it's simultaneously hilarious and uh, well, stultifying. Is that the right word to use in in this context? You've got Nigel Farage, the man who who brought you Brexit, uh, uh, popping up in every studio in the country. Thankfully, some of them containing journalists who are finally getting the hang of interviewing him. Some, sadly, still uh, not quite there yet, and and punting the idea that. Everything is uh, down to immigration. If we just get rid of all the foreigners, we can just stop all the immigration, everything would be great. In that clip there that you just heard in the news, I think he was blaming traffic jams on immigration, which he did ages and ages ago. This is what I mean about it. If you have the misfortune of being professionally required to watch this character quite closely, then you've seen it all before. Even the stuff that's ridiculous comes back round again. The idea that traffic jams are a consequence of immigration. I mean, if that's true, let's consider what the way forward may look like. This perhaps will become policy at some point. If you can trace your family back to the doomsday book, if you can prove that you have been here since the late 11th century, I'm afraid if you can prove that you've been here longer than that, then I, that, that's just unlucky. You, you, we're, we're, the cutoff point is whenever the doomsday, the 1080s or something like that, or maybe a little earlier. If you can trace your family back to the doomsday book, then you can have a special lane on British motorways. It will be called the doomsday lane. You can have the doomsday lane for people who can trace their family in these islands back to shortly after 1066, or there or thereabouts. If you... Uh, I, I mean, where would you put the next cutoff point? I, t t Tudors. T Henry VIII. There you go. That's a nice historical figure that everybody's got a handle on. If you can trace your family back to the reign of Henry VIII, then you have the Henry Lane. So you've got the Doomsday Lane, the Henry Lane. How many lanes can we have, really? I mean, it's five on the M25. Doomsday Lane, Henry Lane. And... And then I'm afraid I'm going to have to have quite a large sweep in the, in the, in the second slowest lane. That will be... Everybody who can trace their residence or their family's roots in this country back between Henry VIII and now. So that's the now lane. The doomsday lane, the Henry lane, and the now... And then it's the immigrant lane. It's th then you've got a lane just for people who were not born here. Uh, and they will have their own immigrant lane. And that is how we will solve the problem described in our news bulletin of it taking you an hour and a half for you to get to visit your Auntie Elsie. Um, 
And that means, of course, that the judgment of, of uh, whether or not a human being is a valid contributor to our society is based on their ethnicity, their race or their, or the, their geographical origins. And that, of course, is racism. Uh, the idea that you need to stop everybody coming here when all of the evidence demonstrates that it is uh, not only a, a desirable but an actually necessary um, antidote to our current demographic woes gets completely ignored. Oh, the Ambo Lane. That's quite strong. Who said Ambo Lane? Oh, you're cleverer than me. I come up with these. That was Vinny, the Ambo Lane. I can't know. It's got to be Henry. It's got to be Doomsday Lane, Henry Lane. Or Queen Victoria Lane, suggests Sebastian. I, I, all right, look, it's not an actual policy. It was just a bit of fun. It's just a sort of loose idea. So... I, you can't not talk about Farage, tempting though that would be. I, I have an odd relationship with the man's uh, p politically. Um, uh, it's highly unlikely I, I, I would have been. Um, I, it's highly unlikely I ever would have presented Newsnight on the BBC, and, and that of course all the book deals, all that kind of thing. I don't know. I, maybe I'm being un, uncharacteristically immodest, but certainly the Newsnight gig came about entirely as a consequence of tearing him to shreds in this studio to the point where he had to be um, dragged out by his own publicist. If, if you haven't seen that, it's, it's available on the LBC website and indeed on YouTube. Um, but on the same page, on the other hand, I'm a proper patriot. I want what's best for this country. And, and what is best for this country is the immediate cessation of the idea that all of our problems can be traced back to the um, nationality of our neighbours. Yeah, you look at what has happened in this country over the last 40 years. Happily, I've written a book about it called How They Broke Britain, in which, of course, Nigel Farage gets his own chapter. The successful attempt to persuade significant swathes of the population that all of their, uh, all of their problems are down to foreigners is an absolutely catastrophic characteristic throughout history, you know, whether it's Viktor Orban in Hungary now or whether it's Adolf Hitler in Germany in the 1930s. If you can persuade enough of a population that their problems are down to the nationality of their neighbours, uh, then you will never, ever, ever get a proper handle on what a country's real problems are. Which brings us, of course, to Brexit. So the last time this country was told that they really needed to get rid of all the foreigners because the country's problems were all down to the foreigners was in 2016. That was the last really big push on if you vote for this, then your uh, GP appointment will become easier. If you vote for this, then I, I, I don't know, your, your traffic jams will become rarer. If you vote for this, you'll have more money. If you vote for this, the fishermen and fisherwomen of these islands will have catches overflowing, teeming with fresh, delicious cod. Uh, the steel industry will go from strength to strength. We're, we're, the cost of living will come down. Food will be cheaper. All of this was, if you like, the, the Nigel Farage package. Uh, God, there's a phrase I should never have said out loud on the radio. But all of that, I mean, it's there in black and white. I promise this will happen. I promise that. And then none of it happened. And you guess what the response is? Well, there is a brilliant Brexit, but it goes to a different school. So what you have in, in, in this character, in this, in this politician, I use the word loosely, but what you have now is a twin promise or, or a twin offering. The first is, it's all the fault of foreigners. And the second is... Brexit being a disaster has nothing to do with me, the man who was probably most associated with explaining why Brexit would be brilliant. So you have to recognise his contribution to the Brexit uh, vote and you have to talk about it now because, unfortunately, he is a significant figure. If a house gets burnt down, then the story in the story of that house, even if the house is a thousand years old, if a house is burnt down then in the story of that house, the arsonist is a major character. We can all agree on that, right? So you might not think that they should be because the architect, the builders, the glaziers, the plumbers, the electricians, the people who worked hard to build a house, the people who lived in the house over the generations of different families that lived in a house, the people who maintained that house, the painters, the decorators, the workers, all of whom contributed to the, to the longevity, to the survival, to the quality of that house. They are not as important as the person who burnt it down. And, and that 
in a nutshell, is why, I, although some people and indeed some of you are all ready getting in touch um, to say just ignore him, that is why you can't just ignore him. You can't just ignore him. I can't talk about him in the way that I would like to because of Ofcom rules and um, the, the various requirements that are in place once candidacy has been established. But I can certainly ask you questions. Uh, I, I think we'll talk about immigration a little later in the programme and that idea of why it remains such a powerful political catnip despite the fact that um, all the people who promise to uh, solve all your problems by reducing the number of foreigners here end up, when they're actually handed power, end up, uh, 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 well, betraying those promises. Why would the king of those broken promises making a political comeback seem such a big story, seem so significant? So bearing in mind before you start having a go that I can't really say what I want to say in this period of, of politics. Happily, I can refer you to How They Broke Britain by James O'Brien, which explains in forensic detail how our wonderful country has been brought to such an unpleasant pass. Uh, and I'll give you a clue. It's got nothing to do with French people driving cars on the M6. But I, I can ask you this. Why, why do you think he's done it? Why do you think he's done it? I, I mean, he probably lied last week. Did he lie last week? Or, or, or was he being economical with the actuality? He was supposed to be going off, wasn't he, to work for the adjudicated rapist and convicted felon Donald Trump, which shows you what his views are regarding, for example, the rule of law or trial by jury. Trial by jury, of course, being a great foundation stone of, of, of parliamentary democracy, of British democracy, but not when it's Donald Trump on the receiving end of a unanimous jury verdict. So he was supposed to be the man who told you that Barack Obama had no business getting involved in Brexit because he was foreign, brackets black, close brackets, uh, was preparing to go off and campaign in a foreign election for an adjudicated rapist and multiple convicted felons. So, I, I, you know, I, was he lying when he said that he wanted to prioritise the adjudicated rapist and multiple felon over the political fate of his own country? Or, or, or was he just, was he drunk? I don't know. I mean, what reason would there be for him to go in the space of a week from saying uh, one thing to saying another? And And then that brings us to... The question of, of possibly how significant this may be. We'll have to wait and see. I know you, you look at the numbers. Uh, fighting two bald men fighting over a comb. What do you do if you're a Tory that doesn't hate foreigners? What, what do you do if you're, a, if you're a traditional conservative who understands why people are crossing the English Channel in boats and also understands what a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion of overall immigration those people represent, those often desperate people risking their lives represent, and also, of course, understand why the numbers of people coming here remain so high. Why, as I told you many years ago, why the number of sectors, the number of professional sectors, which will need exemptions uh, in order to accommodate foreign-born workers, will soon be so big, there will soon be so many exemptions, there will be more sectors with exemptions than without exceptions. I, I told you two things. I said there'll be more sectors with exemptions than there will be without exemptions. And we're nearly there, as um, Michelle Hussain demonstrated quite brilliantly on Radio 4 this morning. So we're nearly there already. And the second thing that will happen is eventually we're going to have to bring back freedom of movement. But not for us, not for our children, not for our people, for them. We'd call it liberty of mobility. Do you remember? For care workers, for hospitality workers, for vets, for doctors, for, for, for nurses, for healthcare workers, for people who work in abattoirs, for people who drive lorries. We'll have that. Yeah, we'll have that. We'll have liberty of mobility for them, but not for our people. And the man who, with the possible exceptions of Dominic Cummings and Boris Johnson, but I, I'm not sure about that. I think when it comes to persuading people to vote for Brexit because they were persuaded that their lives were the fault of foreigners. I don't think anybody came close to doing more in that category than Nigel Farage. And now he's back. Why? 0345 And And here's a question. Knowing what we know about Brexit, knowing what we know about Trump, if you like, knowing what we know about all of the things that Nigel Farage has spent his life selling to you, how, how does he still get away with it, do you think? How, how can it be that some people who thought their life was going to improve immeasurably when they voted for Brexit in 2016 still give him the benefit of the doubt? I'm trying to think of a precedent for that. It's quite weird, isn't it? 
I know there are theories about hedge funds and some people made a ton of money out of Brexit and there's that photograph of Farage pointing at the plummeting pound with an enormous smile on his face. Very patriotic now. Everybody wants a devalued currency if they love the country um, in which the currency holds. But how does he still get away with it? Given that, I mean, I mean, this is, I'm now asking the people who don't phone me anymore. You can phone me today. I hope you can. Don't, don't be shy. Don't be shy. So how, how do you let him continue to get away with it when everything else he's sold you has, has turned to dust in your hands so why has he done it 0345 6060 and how does Nigel Farage continue to get away with making the promise that if only we could get rid of a few more foreigners then everything would be hunky dory by tea time and actually here's a rare opportunity to expand the question a little further is that unfair is, is there more to him than the constant constant promise that if only we could get rid of more foreigners then everything would be hunky-dory by tea time what was that swathe what was the swathe of the brexit vote that he delivered if not the promise that if only we could get rid of more foreigners then everything would be hunky-dory by tea time and, and what more does he offer to voters today than the promise that if only we could get rid of more foreigners, then everything would be hunky-dory by tea time. And that's really the reason why this is such bad news for the Tories, because the Tories have spent much of the last four, three or four years promising the public that if only they could get rid of more foreigners, then everything would be hunky-dory by tea time. People like Sue Ella Braverman and um, Robert Jenrick competing really, to be more robust, more um, outspoken in their promises that if only we could get rid of the foreigners, then everything would be hunky-dory by tea time. And of course, because they have actual power in private, they have to acknowledge the reality. In public, they have to trumpet the fantasy. It's a mad moment. It's an absolutely mad moment in British politics. In fact, moment is not quite the right word it's 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 much bigger than a moment because it has defined the post brexit period of politics as brexit fell apart so the promise the twin promise that if we just got rid of more foreigners everything would be fine and there is a brilliant brexit but it goes to a different school has come to dominate the right of british politics so it's natural and inevitable that the man who embodies those two fantasies those two fraudulent offers is back in the game. Why do you think he's done that? 0345 6060 973. Hit your numbers now. You will get through. And I like this question because there's no definitive answer to it. It's not mystery hour. There's a few that are obvious, a few that perhaps are less obvious. There's a few that you might like, a few that you won't like. But the, the, the bottom line, of course, is that um, he probably doesn't even know why he's chosen this moment to do it. Was he planning it all along? Did he have a year to make a decision and then he made the wrong decision and a week later decided to make the right? Do you see what I mean? It's, it's, um, it's as I say, throughout, it's simultaneously hilarious and horrifying. 